God is good. And all the time. Thank you, my sister, for your song in heaven's eyes or God's eyes, which is the way we should live our lives. You know, there's a verse in Psalm, uh, I think it's 116, verse 15, which says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And when my brother passed away two years ago, that text became very personal because his death was not precious in my sight, but it was precious in the sight of the Lord. So what I had to do was try to see his death the way God saw his death. Are you following me? Yes. We must learn to see the world through God's eyes Amen. or heaven's eyes. That's really the essence of living by faith. And so Jesus says, if someone smites you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. That's not the way the world functions, but that's the way God sees it. And so I am grateful for the song. And may the sentiments of that song long remain with us. And thanks to my young brother who also played the ukulele. Mm -hmm. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. How do you do? How was your day? Good. Did you have a pleasant day? Yes. Did you make time for God? Yes. All right. That's priority number one. Always make time for the person who keeps the breath of life in your nostrils. I had a very pleasant day and I thank God for it. I look forward very much to being with you this evening and I hope that the words God puts in my mouth will be a blessing to you in every way. And may God grant traveling mercies to those who are on their way to this place to listen to his holy word. It is 11 minutes after 7. We should be all done by 8 o'clock, I'm quite sure. Before I begin the message, please do three things for me. Favor number one, if you have a cell phone, I'm asking you very politely, but firmly, please turn your cell phones off. Unless there's some compelling reason why you have to have it on, like being a personal physician to the mayor of San Diego or to La Vista. Other than that, please turn your phones off out of respect for God. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And all I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Let me tell you why my words have no power. You may say amen. amen. They have none. They may hurt you instead of help you. But God's words, they are life. And so Jesus says, the words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. That's not the way my words are. So ask God to put his words in my mouth. That way you protect yourself from error. Are you following me? All right. And favor number three, I want you to think. Our subject for today, a stumbling block. What did I say? A stumbling block. A stumbling block. Let us bow our heads and pray. Loving Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come into your presence, seeking your favor and your blessing. You have preserved our lives and brought us to this place to listen to your word. Now, dear God, grant us the ministry of your spirit, one of whose missions is to lead us and to guide us into truth. Open our minds, open our eyes, enlighten our understanding, I pray. And Father, soften our hearts, Break down the Jericho walls of hard-heartedness that the truth may enter unimpeded. Please speak through me, I pray. For your glory alone, I humble myself in your presence, dear God, and thank you for this tremendous privilege of preaching. Accept this prayer because we've offered it in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen. Luke chapter 17, reading from verse 26. Our subject is a stumbling block. Luke 17, reading from verse 26. And we're reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Luke is Gospel number 3. And Luke, we believe, is the only Bible writer who was not a Jew. Luke was a Gentile by all the biblical evidence. He was not only a Bible writer, he was also a medical doctor. So he's Dr. Luke. Do you have Luke 17, Amen. from verse 26? And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and did what? Destroyed, Destroyed them all. Likewise also, verse 28, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, 
they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and did what? Destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, or just before Jesus Christ comes back. Now, this passage is essential for us to understand the events just before Jesus Christ comes. Let us look closely at what the passage says. Jesus says, the way it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, that's the way it will be just before he comes. So it is not necessary to spend money and go to a psyche to learn what will happen in the future. Jesus says, study the days of Noah, study the days of Lot, and you will have a fairly reliable idea of the conditions that will let you know that Christ is just about to come. That's point number one. Point number two, you will observe in the days of Lot, Noah, and in the days of Lot, I believe the word destroyed is used, am I right? Yes. Destroyed. Now, God destroys a person for how many reasons? One. What's that reason? It's one word, three letters. Sin in the long verses, disobedience. God destroys for one reason. Sin. Because sin, the wages of sin is what? Death or destruction. Now, having said that, we may then conclude that they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Somehow, those were sin. Because that's all Jesus mentions. And in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Somehow, those things amounted to sin and God destroyed them all, the Bible says. We need a clue as to why eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, buying, selling, planting and building can be described as sin. Faith and Works, page 92, paragraph 2. Ella White writes, The Lord would have all things of a temporal interest occupy a secondary place in the heart and thoughts. Shall I say that again? Yes, I will. Faith and Works, page 92, paragraph 2. Listen carefully. The Lord would have all things, or all, yes, all things of a temporal interest occupy a secondary place or position in the heart and the thoughts. So that the things that dominate our thinking should be, should not be the things of this world. The quotation goes on to say, but Satan would have the things of the earth take first place in our lives. What are things of a temporal nature? What are things of the earth? Well, Jesus lists them. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it, they married wives, they were given in marriage. All of these things in and of themselves are not sin. But when they occupy position number one in the life, they qualify us for destruction because then they become sin. But that's the kind of sin that is not very obvious. Because people argue, God gave me a good brain, why shouldn't I get two more degrees? God gave me smarts for business, why shouldn't I start another business? There's no sin in the degree. There's no sin in business. There is sin in putting anything ahead of spiritual concerns. That's where the sin lies. Are you with me? And so having read that now, we must then pause and look at our lives. What occupies our time, our mental energies, our finances? What occupies these things? Is it the kingdom of God or the things of this world? Remember the same Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Christ gives the order of priority. That which pertains to the kingdom of God should come first at all times. When that is the case, everything else falls into its proper place. 
and God can bless. And so we learn that as things were back then, they will be when Jesus comes. We learn that temporal things were among the sins that led to destruction. Temporal things taking priority in the life. We get to conclude that in God's church, many people will be lost. Not because they're murderers and thieves and they participate in genocide, but because the cares of this life took first place in their lives. That's the way it was then. That's the way it will be before Christ comes. But you and I need not fall into that trap. Amen. We see that that is sin. We also can learn from that passage that what led to destruction back then will lead to destruction in the days of Christ's coming. Which then tells us that sin has not changed its character since sin began. Let me say it again. From the entrance of sin in heaven, it began in Lucifer. Sin's character has not changed. We also learned from Luke 6, 17, 26 to 30, that Noah was saved, of course, and uh, Lot was saved. That's by implication. Then whatever saved Noah will save us in the last days. Are you with me? Because Jesus says, as it was back then, that's the way it will be. Whatever saved Lot will save us. What destroyed the people? Sin. What saved Noah? Righteousness. Well, let's take a look at sin. The source of sin, the origin of sin, is Satan. Are you with me? And as I said earlier, sin's character has not changed. Sin has become more intense. Because evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. People become more sinful, but the nature of sin as rebellion against God, as the elevation of my will above God's will, that has never changed. And righteousness has obeyed the will of God, that has never changed. The source of sin, the origin of sin, is Satan. And his intention originally remains his intention today that has not changed so we can say as it was in the days of the original rebellion and that happened in heaven so shall it be just before christ comes and so has it been from then until now what was the basis of satan's rebellion a basis that has not changed as it was then so shall it be now because that will lead us to understand a stumbling block let us go to isaiah chapter 14 we shall read from verse 12. isaiah 14 reading from verse 12 our subject is a stumbling block it is 723 we have 37 minutes, give or take. You have Isaiah 14, Amen. reading from verse 12. The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast, cast down where? Yeah. To the ground which this weakened the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will do what? Ascend into heaven. I will exalt my stars above the throne of God. I will ascend, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Let us look at those five expressions and they all came from Lucifer's heart. I will ascend into heaven. Where did Lucifer live? In heaven. In heaven. Why does he have to ascend into heaven? That's where he lived. And why ascend? He lived in heaven. Where was his position of service? Right next to God. You can't get any higher in heaven as a created being than standing at the right hand of God. As the anointed, hand-picked, covering cherub. So what did he mean? I will ascend into heaven. It has to mean more than occupy a physical place. He was referring to a position of rulership. The position God had. That is what he did not enjoy. So I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. What did he mean by the stars of God? The Bible speaks of three heavens. There is a heaven where the birds fly, where the clouds are. There is a heaven where the planets are, the stars. Then there's the heaven where God lives. 
three levels. And Paul went to the third heaven, the Bible says. When Lucifer said, I will ascend above the, exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars do not refer to the heavenly bodies. In Job 38 verse 7, the Bible says the morning stars shouted, the sons of God shouted for joy. Of course, the morning stars sang together. Referring to the rejoicing of God's created beings, including angels, at the creation of this world. Stars refer to intelligent beings. In Revelation chapter 12, I believe it's verse 3 or 4, the Bible says, And they still drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and they cast them to the earth. Referring to angels that followed Lucifer. So when he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, what he wants to say is, I will occupy a position of supreme rulership over all the intelligent beings. So he wants to ascend into heaven, he wants to be in charge. He wants to exalt his throne above the stars of God. I will sit also in the mount of the congregations in the sides of the north. The sides of the north was a side of power. The side where the invading force came from. So that God put the table of shewbread in the sanctuary facing the north. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. The enemy came from the north. And that Satan said, that's where I will sit. All three quotations all refer to preeminence and authority. Verse 4. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now there are no clouds where God lives. Clouds have to do with, you know, lakes and streams and evaporation, condensation. There are no clouds. But the Bible says that uh, the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12, verse 1. Clouds refer to large masses of people. Are you with me? Whether they be angels or people. Now, Lucifer said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, again, above all created beings. Then he summarizes the four into number five. I will be, finish it for me, like the most high. That has not changed. As it was at the point of Lucifer's rebellion, so is it now. But, there was a stumbling block to Lucifer's ambition to be like the Most High. Remember our theme for this week is a people of destiny and our destiny as given to us by God is to lift up certain doctrines before a world that has no clue. But let me tell you something that's very serious. God has never had two special people. You didn't get what I said. God has never had two special people. He has always had one and has tried to work through them to bring others to them. Amen. And so he told Abraham, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God has never had two special people. Even when the Jews were in Babylonian captivity, they were still God's special people. As it is in these days, God has a special people based on what he's given them to preach. No different from the Israelites. We need to understand that. Stumbling block. There was one that stood in Lucifer's way. Lucifer said, I will be like the Most High. God requires one thing of his created beings. What's that one thing? Allegiance. Or I give you another word. Allegiance. Give me another word. Starts with a W, ends with a P. Worship. worship. And obedience is the highest form of worship. Are you with me? All right, so you're not wrong. God requires of all created beings worship. I didn't say only of all created intelligent beings. I said of all, let me say all creation. God requires worship. This is the relationship that God arranged when he made the heaven and the earth. I am the creator. You are created. The divinely established relationship is you depend on me and I take care of you. You worship me and I bless you. You look to me for moment by moment sustenance and I pour out my blessings upon you as long as you maintain this relationship. Trust, worship, dependence. Amen. By the way, let me throw this in. 
This is the Sabbath principle. You see, before creation of the earth, there was no Sabbath day, but there was the Sabbath principle, which is total dependence upon God. Are you with me? Yeah. Remember yesterday I asked you, are you a Sabbath keeper on Tuesday? Do you remember that? Yes, yes. And some of you said no. Now, here's how you're a Sabbath keeper on Tuesday. Are you dependent upon God today, Sunday, which is not the Sabbath? Yes. Will you be dependent tomorrow if He gives you life? Yes. That is the Sabbath principle at work. Mon Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday. So that the Sabbath is with us how many days of the week? Seven days. But which 24-hour period is the Sabbath? The seventh day. Let me say it again. The Sabbath principle which is total dependence upon God that must go with us seven days a week Amen. when you understand that you understand why the Sabbath lies at the very foundation of worship to God now God arranged I am created you are created you worship me there was a stumbling block Here's the stumbling block, which is in keeping with our theme for this week. In Exodus chapter 20, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, and out of the house of bondage. Read commandment number one for me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, the angels knew that. Because God's law has always been His will for all His created intelligent beings. Let me say that again. Every angel, every created intelligent being is required by God to live by His law. God's law is God's will for the entire creation. The angels knew somehow that the, the, the law said, Thou shall have no other gods before me. Lucifer said, I will be like the Most High. In order for him to be like the Most High, he must have someone to rule over. Are you with me? But the angels were faithful to the law which said, or the commandment which said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So that commandment in particular, and the Ten Commandments in general, they represented what? A stumbling block to Satan's ambition to be like the Most High God. <laughs> it's, it's all legal. It was a stumbling block. He had to get rid of it. Now, Ella White writes in uh, Signs of the Times, September 24, 1894, paragraph 4. It is a beautiful quotation. God alone has the prerogative to prescribe the duty of men and angels. Let me say that again. God alone has the prerogative to prescribe the duty of men and angels. The will of God is a perfect will and must be obeyed as it is set forth in His holy law. That is very clear wording. The will of God is His law because every requirement is just and is set forth by infinite wisdom. Then the quotation concludes with these beautiful words. The law of God should be obeyed even though there were no authority to enforce it and no reward for its obedience. Amen. Yeah. Mm. 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 All right. Uh, I didn't get a bit there on that. <laughs> Maybe I was speaking Swahili and you missed it. Let me say it again. Shall I say it again? Amen. Yes. Amen. Let me give you, well, the last part. The law of God should be obeyed, even though there were no authority to enforce it, and no reward for its obedience. Amen. Amen. Which means it is so good, that even if there were no heaven, hmm, that's the way to live. Amen. So you obey God's law not to go to heaven. Are you with me? Yeah. Come on, are you with me? Yeah. You obey God's law because it is so good. Amen. Have you
you ever been to the store and you found a bargain, you didn't need it, but the bargain was so good you could not pass it up. Come on, say a minute, confess your sins. The ladies, can I pick on the ladies? You could not pass it up, but you didn't need the thing. The bargain was too good. The law of God is a bargain not to be passed up. Amen. And so the pen of inspiration says, the law of God should be obeyed even though there were no authority to enforce it and no reward for its obedience. If you look at that, then you understand she's also saying there is an authority to enforce it and there is a reward for its obedience. Now come on, say amen to that as well. There is a reward for obedience. But she's saying, don't keep the law for the reward. Keep it because of the nature of the law. It is good. Now, listen to the description of God, what God wants. But he that cometh unto him must believe without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh unto God must believe what? That he is. That's first. Are you with me? Amen. That is first. Now, that's similar to what Eloi said. In other words, God is so sweet that if he never ever bless me, I want to serve him. So the verse says you must believe that he is, he is what? He's holy, he's just, he's good, he's forgiving, he's always right, he's always everything that's good. That's what he is. And you can stop right there. But God wants to bless us and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But too many of us serve God for the rewards. Not because of the kind of God he is. Are you with me? Yeah. No, you're not with me. <laughs> you're not with me, it's my fault. Let me try again. We must serve God because of who He is. He is just good. Amen. If He does nothing for me, God is good. If He sends me into hell, God is good. It is for that reason we serve Him. He is just good. Amen. And a being that good ought to be served. Amen. With no concept or no thought for reward. Amen. Now, when you have that relationship with God, Amen. Hmm? No selfishness enters into it. You know how many people leave God because he did not give them what they wanted? I prayed 15 years for a husband, didn't get it. I prayed 20 years for a job, didn't get it. I prayed for this thing, didn't get it. Uh, God didn't give me what I said, they didn't obey my command, I leave him. Because they don't serve him for who he is. They serve him for what they can get. And so the crowd followed Jesus in John chapter 6. And Jesus says, you seek me, not because you saw the miracle, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. The law of God, let me get back to it, is so good. Amen. The angels love to keep it. And so as I said yesterday, I can understand the psalmist in Psalm 119 verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. I just love it, says David. Amen. You flip that and you get the expression of Satan. And what's Satan's expression? Oh, how I hate my law. It is my irritation all the day. <laughs> this was Satan's stumbling block. Now, Satan works through agents. His original uh, deception, he did it himself. When he came to the garden, he worked through a serpent. When he got Eve, he worked through Eve to get Adam. Let me tell you something, Satan works through agents, he does not come himself, he works through agents. Now, according to Revelation, the devil, the devil has two agents that help him do his work, to establish his kingdom. The beast and the false prophet. If you study your Revelation, you should know that. The beast of Revelation 13 and the false prophet also of Revelation 13. The beast, Revelation 1, 13, 1 to 10. The false prophet, Revelation 13, 11 to 18. Now, we know as Adventists and in our interpretation, the false prophet represents who? <laughs> this is not good. This is embarrassing. Is this on the internet? Yes. Well, the, those of you on the internet, <laughs> God bless you. We had a rough day today, so we're not thinking. Forgive us. Who is the false prophet of Revelation 13? I don't believe this. Who is the false prophet of Revelation 13, 11 through 18? You're not 
like to say, who's, who's the two-horned beast? Let me make it easier for you. The United States. Call the false prophet. In Revelation 19. The United States is the two-horned beast that came up at the time of the leopard-like beast in Revelation 13, 1 through 10. So Satan has, and this is a different sermon to preach in the United States, the land of the free and the bold or whatever else. Satan has two agents that help him. Satan is a dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, or the two-horned beast. You have the leopard-like beast, which is the papacy, and the two-horned beast, which is the United States. You have the dragon, which is Satan. Now in heaven you have Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Are you following me? On earth you have Satan, that's the satanic father. You have the beast, the satanic son. You have the false prophet, the satanic spirit. Now, the beast, which Satan has used for hundreds of years, the papers, hundreds of years, the Antichrist, hundreds of years he has used. The false prophet, simply since the 70s, the beast, hundreds of years he has used this agent to carry out his mission. Now, that, one of the identifying marks of that power, according to Daniel 7.25, and he shall seek to do what, or think to do what? Change what? Times and laws. Because if that power can change the law, the power that makes the law is the power that gets the what? The worship. Ah, oh, you're a little slow tonight. Let me say it again. The power that makes the law is the power that receives the worship. And so the same way Satan regarded the law as a stumbling block, he wanted to change it so that the angels could worship him. His agent does the same thing. Try to change the law. To win people over to his side. Because the maker of the law is the one that deserves the worship. Because the law determines how we live. And so this leopard-like beast of Revelation 13, this little horn of Daniel 7, this man of sin or the son of perdition of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4, this power, this agent of Satan has the same mind as Satan. Because Revelation 13 verse 4 says, And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast. The mind of Satan is the mind of a sinner. Let me slow down and stop fussing at you. And let me say it slowly. And I've said it on several messages, I'm sure, if you all listen to YouTube and audio verse. Sin is sin regardless in whom it is found. Are you following me? Sin is violation of God's law or rebellion against God or placing your will above God's will. It is all the same thing or the proportion of self. All the same thing. That has never changed. Now, it is more intensely expressed in Satan than in us because he has the power to express that sinfulness we don't have. But the essential nature of sin remains the same. So it is not surprising that Satan's original intention is reproduced in his agent, the, the leopard-like beast. Satan's problem, get rid of the law. The problem of the beast, change the law, which is the same with getting rid of the law. You know there are two versions of the Ten Commandments? Let me tell you the version from the Bible. Will you know it? Thou shalt have no gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Do not take the Lord's, Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. That's the ten in the Bible. Now the ten in the Catholic Catechism starts similarly. Thou shalt have no gods before me. In the Bible, yes. Catechism, yes. The Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. The Catechism does not have that. So immediately, the Catechism version is different from the Bible's version. Now, let me be fair. The Catholic Bible has it the same way your Bible has it. But instruction in the Catholic Church is not given mainly from the Bible. It is given from the Catechism. The Catechism declares the teaching of that church. Now, so the Catechism does not have Commandment 2. Why? Because Commandment 2 says, don't worship images, and the church does. 
And so in the Bible, commandment three is, don't take God's name in vain. In the Catechism, commandment three is, remember the Sabbath day. In the Bible, commandment four is, remember the Sabbath day. In the Catechism, commandment four is what? Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, of course, because the church took out two, it had to split number ten into two. So you have, don't covet your house and don't covet your neighbor. So that we have two different versions of the Ten Commandments. Now listen to me carefully. The law of the Lord is perfect. If you make one change, it's no longer perfect. It's no longer the same law. I don't care how it looks externally. If you make one change in something that's perfect, it ceases to be what it was. You can't improve on perfection. Ah, you didn't follow me. Ladies, let me pick on you again. You know how you stand in the mirror and fix your hair? And whatever you fix. Until everything is in place. Then you walk out to go to the kitchen to cook. You're not even going to the store. You just go to the kitchen. But every hair has... To, am I right? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Confess your sins. Now the law of God is perfect. The slightest change means it's no longer God's law. Because God's law cannot have imperfection in it. Now let me show you something else as we continue a stumbling law. The Bible says, the Bible summarizes the law into two. We know the two tables, love for God, love for your fellow man. How do we know that? Well, because when the lawyer came to Christ in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 10, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, all thy heart, thy soul, thy strength, thy mind. Christ said, fine, do this and thou shalt live. But when Christ spoke to the rich young ruler, he said, you know, the rich young ruler went through the commandments, God said, fine. So the Ten Commandments are really, love to God, love to your fellow man. Let me slow down again. Now, if you keep this in mind, love to God, love to your fellow man, those are the Ten Commandments. The first four represent love to God. Are you following me? This is very crucial. The next six represent love to fellow man. Look at the first four in God's version. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Those four show your love for God. The other six for man. But in the Catholic version in the Catechism, commandment four has honor thy father and thy mother. Now, you, you haven't gotten the weight of what I'm trying to say. You see, <laughs> the first table in the Catholic Catechism has honor thy father and thy mother on it, not in the Bible version. By putting it, whether they planned it or not, by putting honor thy father and thy mother on the first table, which is not what God did, they have placed who is the father of the Catholic Church? <laughs> Who is the mother of the Catholic Church? Mary. Mary. Now based on their version of the Ten Commandments, what status have been given to the Pope and to Mary? Mm -hmm. You've got to change the law to get people to follow you. The law as God arranged it has no room for the Pope. And none for Mary. God rest her soul. She's the mother of Jesus Christ. No room for the Pope. No room for Mary. Now that's a stumbling block to Satan. Who wants to be like the most high God. And to, to be like God. You've got to change God's law. That you may run your own kingdom. And so he carrying out the same mindset. Through his agent. The leopard like beast. Change that law. I try. But I feel, let me try it through you. Change it and listen to me. Most of the world follows. And the Adventist preachers will tell you, why do you make a big fuss about the Sabbath? Why do you make a big fuss about the Sabbath? What's the big thing? Well, yes it is. But that Sabbath commandment, and the law in general constitute a stumbling block to Satan's attempt to set up his universal dominion. 
And so we read in Revelation 13 verse 4, And they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worship the beast. We read in Revelation 13 verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. But we have a counter call in Revelation 14 verse 6, to fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that did what made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Worship Him who set up the dependent system. The other call is worship the dragon, worship the beast. See, to worship the beast is to worship the dragon. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 20, the Gentiles, when they offer to idols, they're really offering to devils. Because the idols are lifeless. You're not with me. You need to understand that essentially all worship goes either to God or to Satan. You may kneel before this desk and call it your God and pray. No, you've prayed to Satan. You either pray to God or to Satan. The Bible says when you make an offering to an idol, you've made it to a devil. So it's either God or so, you know, Jesus told the, 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 uh, the woman at the well, John chapter 4, you worship, you know not what. You didn't get what I said. Yeah. What did Paul tell the Athenians? Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. There are many of us who are worshiping false gods and not knowing it. In the Adventist church. Let me give an example. There are a lot of strange beliefs in this church. This is my church. You have to carry me out dead. Are you with me? Yes. You have to carry me out dead with the capital D. I'm not leaving now. Ellen <laughs> White writes in Great Controversy, page 583, paragraph 1. Listen carefully. 10 to 8. It is as easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as to fashion an idol of wood or stone. Let me tell you, there are Adventists worshipping an idol by holding to beliefs that are not biblical. The belief becomes an idol. Write the quotation down. Great Controversy, page 583, paragraph 1. It is as easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as it is to fashion an idol of wood or stone. I was preaching in California somewhere, no, no, uh, Suddenly, the uh, Loma Linda area, a few years ago, this after I preached, this man came to me, haunted me in the room, 15 minutes trying to tell me how Jesus is less than God. And my only regret was I allowed him to waste my time. Jesus is less than God. How could she? That belief, stubbornly held, will take you straight to hell. The Adventists who believe the atonement ended at the cross and nothing you say from scripture or Ellen White will change their mind. It is, it is a darling belief and they hold to these false beliefs. It is as easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as it is to fashion an idol of wood and stone. In that same chapter, uh, page 583, paragraph 1, she writes, The God of many professedly wise men, of philosophers, poets, politicians, journalists, the God of uh, polished, fashionable circles of many colleges and universities, even of some theological institutions, is little better than Baal, the sun god of Phoenicia. <laughs> because of the theories we hold. There's a belief in the Adventist church, the earth was not made in seven days, in six days. Yes, there's some scholars in our church that believe and they write well-worded articles, rubbish. Rubbish. Pure rubbish. Amen. And they stick to it. I see no evidence for a six day creation. Well, are you blind? <laughs> are you blind? <coughs> it's a lie. I hate to irritate your stomach, but I'll say it again. It is as easy to fashion an idol of false doctrines and theories as it, it is easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as it is to fashion an idol of wood or stone. My question for you is, is Satan succeeding in establishing his kingdom in your life? Are you holding to God's word 
Are you grounded in God's law, which is the stumbling block for Satan? And so in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious in Christ. But unto them which be disobedient, notice the opposite, believe and disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of a corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Disobedience to God's law, because the law is the stumbling block for Satan. And as I told you yesterday, Great Controversy, page 582, paragraph 1, from the very beginning of the Great Controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has carried forth, carried forth this same warfare upon the earth. The warfare has not changed. The stumbling block has not changed. Praise God for that. Amen. Wherever Lucifer turns, he comes up against God's law. Amen. And when he comes up against the Adventist church, Lucifer should have a headache. Because we are defenders Amen. of God's law. Amen. Patriots and Prophets, page 126, paragraph 1, in order that God might qualify him for his great work as the keeper of the sacred oracles, referring to Abraham. Abraham must be separated from the associations of his early life. Abraham was given the sacred oracles, the Ten Commandments. You preserve those in your life by obedience, be an example to others, pass it down, pass it down. It was a vast Isaac to jo Jacob, to Joseph, all the way down. And we are the last day remnant of that tradition. Come on, say amen. 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 And the sacred oracles have been given to us. We have the stumbling block that keeps Satan flat on his face. Amen. When you stumble over something, don't you move it? He would love to move it. I was in a certain part of the world. I won't mention the area. And I was staying with a pastor in that field. I'm going to see him again this year. And he told me something that I had him to repeat because I couldn't believe it. In his field, he told me, and God is my witness, there is a movement to make the Ten Commandments optional. Now, I'm not talking about a Baptist field. They're not Catholics. Who are they? Some devils. Officials in that field are trying to make the Ten Commandments optional so that more people can be one. They have never read Evangelism, page 137, paragraph 1. Never bring the truth down to a low level in order to obtain converts. But seek to bring the sinful and corrupted up to the high standards of the law of God. He also told me in that field a petition was circulated by the officials of that field and every pastor in that field had to sign I will not quote Ellen White from the desk I won't call the field I won't say anything I'll see him later this year he must confirm that again I will not and he refused to sign Amen. Amen. and they brought him in why won't you sign and then he pointed out that an official in that power structure was involved in something that supported Satan's kingdom. They were shocked that he knew, and when he brought that up, they let him go. But I tell you what it was, the official is a member of the local witch society. <laughs> That's why I had to tell him, tell me that again. Tell me, he said, yes. He said, there's pictures on the website for the witches association of that particular area and I could not believe it. Listen to me, the worst enemy of the church is the church or aspects of the church. Let me say that carefully. God has a stumbling block to keep Satan on his feet, off his feet and that stumbling block is the law of God which expresses the righteousness of Christ. Another way of saying righteousness is life, you know. Righteousness is not just a quality, it is life. Satan has not changed his ambition. In heaven, his desire was, I will be like the Most High through one of his agents, the beast. He is trying to overthrow God's law, establish his version that he may win king's subjects to his kingdom. And most of the world really follows Satan. When you observe Sunday, you're observing Satan's power. Not just the beast, 
Understand me clearly. Remember Revelation 13, 4, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Satan is the power behind the throne. Are you with me? So when you keep Sunday, whether you do it deliberately or accidentally, you are acknowledging the power of Satan. When you keep the Sabbath, you are acknowledging the power of the creator of heaven and earth. Amen. The stumbling block is God's law. And the central feature of that stumbling block is God's self. Come on. My brothers and sisters, we are people of destiny. God has called this church to warn the world that the world has trampled upon God's law. And that has to stop or the world will pay a very, very serious price. Ella White writes, No name which we can take will be appropriate. But that which accord with our profession and expresses our faith and marks us a peculiar people. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world. Are you with me? Here is the line of distinction between those who worship the Creator and those who worship the beast and receive his mark. She said the name, the very name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke. And then she specifies she goes to the law. Here is the mark of distinction between those who worship God and those who worship the beast and receive his mark. Even our name is part of the attack against Satan's kingdom. It is a standing rebuke to the prophets of the world. The name Seventh-day Adventist, that quotation was Testimonies, Volume 1, page 223, paragraph 3. Now, Testimonies, Volume 1, page 224, paragraph 1, she says, The name Seventh-day Adventist carries the true features of our faith in front and will rebuke the inquiring mind. Like an arrow from the Lord's quiver, it will wound the transgressors of God's law and lead to faith, repentance toward faith in the Lord Jesus and repentance towards God. Just the name. You know there was a movement to shorten the name? To just Adventist? <laughs> well, the name is too long, some people said. Let's just use Adventist for short. Adventist says nothing. Seventh-day Adventist. Hmm? Now, it wasn't the world that tried to shorten it. Some within the church suggested Seventh-day Adventist is too long. But Ellen White said in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 223, paragraph 1, I was shown in regard to the remnant people of God choosing a name. She saw the name God wanted was what? Seventh-day Adventist. We are a people of destiny. It is our mission as a church, but a church is made up of individuals, first by the lives we live, to uphold God's holy law. Not for reward, but because the law is so good. And secondly, by active evangelism. To call the world to acknowledge God. And the only way to acknowledge God from the heart is to obey God's law. Amen. And so I thank God for this stumbling block. I really do. Amen. It caused Lucifer to stumble in heaven. He stumbled right out of heaven. And he will stumble right out of existence when Jesus Christ comes back. Amen. And between then and now, God had a people called the Israelites to raise up the law. They failed miserably. Just a few were faithful. And in these last days, God has spiritual Israel. He has us to raise up that law as an expression of God's holiness, God's righteousness, and the lifestyle required of everyone who desires to live in a sinless world. Praise the Lord. Is it your desire to live in that world? Yeah. Is it your desire to hold up that stumbling block? Yeah. Can you raise your hand with me, my dear brothers? Oh, God bless you. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, that what caused Satan to stumble way back then causes him to stumble today. And you have honored us so highly by choosing us above all others to be the preservers of that stumbling block, to live out the principles of that stumbling block in our lives and to preach it to others that Satan may stumble, stumble, stumble until he stumbles out of existence. Amen. Please, God, keep us faithful to this calling. Let us always remember we are people of destiny. Bless us, take us home safely, bring us back tomorrow. We pray with those whom we invite in Jesus' name and for his sake that all God's people say, Amen, amen. and Amen. God bless you. Amen. Please drive carefully and remember to obey the laws of the land. Don't speed. <laughs>